the Skellig Island, a very cool movie location for the first Jedi temple in the Star Wars Skywalker saga. But also a real life ancient marvel that's more captivating than any otherworldly movie magic. Skellig Michael and the little Skellig Islands aren't exactly in a galaxy far, far away. They're just about eight miles off the stunning southwest Atlantic coast of Ireland. But despite the relatively short distance, the trip here from the mainland can be fairly treacherous, so dangerous that even today, the journey by boat may be canceled more often than it runs. And that's assuming you can book one of the few tickets to travel here. Since visitors are limited to only a handful of folks each day, because these places hold ancient and natural wonders that simply cannot handle crowds. And it was the remoteness of Skellig Michael that drew Christian monks here to this place long ago, probably sometime around the 7th century. They rode here through dangerous seas to establish a monastery precisely because they believed this place to be at the edge of the known world right at the boundary between earth and heaven. And they brought with them some very ancient engineering knowledge that helped them build these amazing structures you can see standing today, the Klohan. These beehive huts are some of the oldest standing structures on the planet. They're surprisingly large, sturdy, and waterproof for their age, especially because they were crafted entirely by the careful placement of dry stone and the use of force. You know, physics. What force did you think I meant? You know, the dun 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 dun. That's Harry Potter. <laughs> anyway, we got to be one of the lucky few that got to see these ancient wonders up close on our visit. I've got a good feeling about this. Let's go. Can we tell you a tale of ancient Jedi temples, monastic hermits, and puffins all at the same time? Maybe. Let's try. Let's go. We begin our journey just like the ancient monks in a crashing about our summer seas. Even under diesel power, it took us almost two rain-filled, choppy hours to arrive at the island. For the monks who came here around the 600s, it would have taken them probably all day to row out. Now, landing on the island is a particularly special adventure of quickly launching yourself off a heaving boat onto a small concrete dock and basically hoping you don't miss. Not all terrifying especially when you're feet away from a very hard and dangerous looking rock face that you definitely do not want to crash into. Courage is required here even today. For the monks landing here, it would have been even riskier in a wooden boat without the benefit of a dock or structure or even help anywhere nearby if something went wrong. Which something probably did. Probably did. I don't see how it didn't or couldn't have. But at least their boat was probably quieter than ours. Maybe fewer diesel fumes. Mm -hmm. pollution. Now that we're on the island, it's time for the climb and to rhyme. For the monks, getting up high would have been an issue both of safety to protect themselves from invaders like Vikings who occasionally would attack the island, but also of aesthetic practice. You see, back then it was widely believed that God lived in the heavens that were on the edge of the known world. So to live up high and far out meant that you were living closer to him. And that was the point of being out here after all, to get closer to God. So we climbed the 600 wind and rain soaked slippery steps carved into the weather beaten cliffs to the 715 foot summit. I'm sure you, you can't see it, but there's water very far down there. And it's very sheer. And it's very foggy. It was a challenge. It was awful. I nearly fell off the cliff. It was an experience. And if you haven't figured this out already, the difficulty in isolation is the first wondrous feat of engineering at this site. The fact that these monks could reach this island and build anything at all here, let alone these long-standing, sturdy huts, hundreds of feet in the air on this tiny little point of a rock, that's evidence of their skill and determination. And trust me, you need determination to face this climb. And once you finally reach the top, you'll find the monks' construction creations hanging out up there in the clouds. And despite Viking raids, relentless gales, the march of time and tourists, and even some movie crews, some structures have miraculously endured fairly intact for centuries. The historical construction on Skull Michaels includes two main features the hermitage, and the monastery. Now both these structures blend seamlessly into the surroundings, kind of like the earth just birthed them itself, showcasing the monk's incredible skill in building, not just in this environment, but with it. And if you look at the island from the sea, 
on a day when you can actually see anything that is, which is not the days that we were there, unfortunately. But anyway, you'll notice two distinct peaks. The Hermitage rests just below the South Peak on the island. This is not open to visitors, and frankly, it's probably not even all that accessible to the monks who lived here. This area was probably built after the main monastery, which is the part we visited on our trip. The monastery is a compact space built on a steeply sloping plateau, and it's really the only spot on the island where the monks could have probably even tried to build something like this. It includes the remnants of a church, a large and small oratory, a garden, and a graveyard. This monastery is meticulously planned, sitting sheltered to the north by natural rocks and protected to the south by a series of man-made retaining walls. These walls are crucial to the site. Not only do they shield the site from prevailing southerly winds, but they also create level terraces for remaining structures. Over the years, exposure to the elements has led to collapse of many of the walls, some during the original habitation period and others in later years. And this is the second amazing wonder about this place. These dwellings are very old. They were likely first built sometime in the 600s and then inhabited for a remarkably long time, at least until the 12th century by the monks who lived here, and then off and on by others for portions of the year. And it's the structures where they live that are the most remarkable of them all. These six original beehive cells are the dwellings where around 12 monks, an abbot, maybe Luke, found retreat. And it's the design and shape of these huts that make them truly special. The huts are conical in shape resembling beehives, which is how they got their nickname. These huts are commonly found along the southwest coast of Ireland, often associated with Christian settlements. But this construction method known as corbelling has a long history that dates back thousands of years, and it's seen in architectural examples from around the world. In various parts of Europe, ancient palaces in Syria, Bronze Age tombs in Greece. You can even find these in pre-Columbian Mesoamerican construction. This is ancient engineering technology, and here's how it works. So. Do you want to know how these, these beehives were built? Well, you probably think they were built with mortar and stuff. No, no mortar here. Just rock upon rock upon rock upon rock. And they're watertight. And for changes, they're very flexible, which is pretty good. And honestly, I don't think modern humanity technology can do that, but they could. Wow. The huts are dry stone construction, meaning no mortar was used to hold these stones together. Instead, the stones are carefully selected and placed so that each stone overlaps the one beneath it and projects slightly inward over the stone below. The process of corbelling is based on using the corbel arch to build a simple vault. The rows of corbels gradually build a wall until the opening at the top can be spanned by a slab. And it is this design that results in a shape that is not only aesthetically pleasing, but also functional. It keeps the hut stable, flexible, and waterproof as the water runs off the sides. In fact, we can personally attest to the relative dryness of the shelter provided by these huts. It was much appreciated on our rainy day. Yes, very waterproof. And their longevity at the site is further underscored by the fact that the beehive huts have outlasted newer buildings built here, such as the church that dates to probably around the 10th century. While the church was constructed with mortar, today it's mostly collapsed, and those beehive huts are still standing strong. Now, you may be wondering why we don't see more corbelling in modern structures, and here's where we call upon the force of oh, physics. Static physics, that is, examining forces on objects that are at rest. You don't want your building moving, right? That would be bad. As it turns out, the Corbel Arch, while it was certainly an improvement in ancient engineering, is not entirely self-supporting. So it doesn't distribute the force across the arch. For this reason, it is sometimes called a false arch. It's more like an inverted staircase, with stones sticking out into the interior as the structure builds up to the top. So there's no curve supporting the weight. The corbel is more like a balancing act in terms of the physics, with each stone supporting the one above, kind of like a house of cards. Which means it's not as efficient or as stable as the beautiful curves of a true arch, sometimes called a Roman arch. You'll find this familiar arch shape in the grandest historical structures, each stone precisely cut and perfectly wedged into place to form a curve. The wedge-like stones that make up the arch are called voisseur, and each one shares forces with the other stones in the arch. They kind of all lean on each other for support and stability to achieve the perfect state of balance or static equilibrium. 
The load is shared evenly with the keystone, that top block in the arch, holding everything in place. So you could say that the Roman arch brings balance to the force. I love Star Wars more than you, but you really gotta like pull your jets with the Star Wars stuff. May the physics be with you. I'm gone. Oh, come on. I'm taking my water bottle. Wow. That was it, people. Hit his limit. Might be our last video ever. <laughs>